She had a terrible time. The town hated her. She was not the hero to many people. She was somehow the devil incarnate. She was called that awful woman by her neighbors and that atheist mother by newspapers across the country. Her friends stopped returning phone calls rather than risk speaking with her. She was branded a communist, and the Illinois state legislature nearly stopped her and her husband from ever working at the state university again. She received up to 200 letters a day, some of the writers claiming they would pray for her, many wishing for much worse. They heard this down there, big the wig down there, Main Street. They're gonna lynch you. Oh, I said, is that all? All because in 1945, Vashti McCollum, a young mother of three from Champaign, Illinois, would file a historic lawsuit that would forever change the relationship between religion and public schools in America. It has been listed as the foundation case for prayer in school and religious education in school. What McCollum did was it endorsed a view of the First Amendment that pushed public life and religion into separate spheres uh, and divided by this wall of separation. I think public opinion polls show that a majority of Americans say they think the term a wall of separation between church and state is written into the text of the First Amendment. And of course, it's not. It's an idea. It's a metaphor uh, that is contestable. Uh, but it's one that the Supreme Court put the weight of the Constitution behind in the McCollum decision. All cases involving the crossing of the line regarding establishment of a religion, crushes on public property, Ten Commandments in public buildings and on public property, Put it down. prayers in the schools and this sort of thing, all these stem from the McCollum case. That's basically the significance of the case. The case would shine a national spotlight on this small central Illinois town, turning Vashti McCollum into an unlikely champion of the separation of church and state. What courage it must have taken for a mother and her young children to stand up to that and say, this is something that you can't do. You cannot bring God into the public school. Champaign-Urbana, Illinois was like many American small towns in the 1940s, rural, isolated, and quiet. Surrounded by miles and miles of corn and soybean fields, Champaign was also the home of the state's main university, then a regional school, originally founded to train rural students in agriculture and engineering. Champaign-Urbana was middle-class America, but with a fringe of college. It was uh, conservative and Republican, predominantly. There were very few uh, black people who were uh, visible. And there was a black, uh, significant minority community, but it was a very, very uh, segregated community. Religion was really a vital part of, of a lot of our lives. Invocations was given, at, often given at public events. Christian music was played in the schools. And so uh, religion was a closer part of everyday life. Well, it seems as though almost everybody went to church and regularly. The majority went to Protestant churches, the mainline ones. But your religion was known. In June of 1940, 
the Champaign School Board decided to begin a program that was increasingly being used in districts around the country. Known as released time, the students would take time out during the school day for a religion class. It was suggested as a way of dealing with juvenile delinquency, which was perceived to be a problem. Well, a problem compared to today. It was no problem at all, but it was perceived to be a problem. The idea was that the youngsters would go to local churches, would be dismissed from school and go to local churches. Now that is kind of difficult because the churches aren't located convenient to all the schools. So the program was then uh, designed to where the religious teachers would come into the schools. It was quite common to have religious instruction in the schools, typically generic Protestant, and there were complaints by Catholics and Jews in particular about what was going on. Morning devotions were very common. Uh, some states, uh, such as Pennsylvania, had required uh, the reading of 10 verses of the King James Bible, the Protestant Bible, each morning, or face dismissal. I think religion was taken for granted by the public schools in the 1940s. We celebrated Christmas, we celebrated Easter, um, we said uh, prayers in the morning, and then we saluted the flag. So everything was connecting nationhood to religion and religion to Christianity. And that's the way the image, the associations were formed. The Champaign, Illinois religion class would be voluntary and meet for 30 minutes once a week. Parents had to give their kids permission to attend. And at that time, they passed out these little cards uh, and you were supposed to get your parents' signature on the card and bring 25 cents in with it, and that would enroll you in the class. Um, I wanted to be in with everybody else, but my mother didn't think that was a good idea, and, and she resisted it. When we said no, it didn't phase him until it was pointed out. He was one of the few that wasn't taking it. I suppose that bothered him somewhat. It bothered the rest of the kids in this class. The teacher was very adamant and put pressure on me, put pressure on my, my parents, uh, and eventually I put enough pressure on my parents to get into the class towards the end of the semester. He came home after a few weeks. It was Easter time, and he had a poster that he'd colored showing the Resurrection. Whew. I thought this was not what I had expected at all. I thought they'd teach us something about the history, the culture, but not indoctrination in the old Christian faith. So I said, never again. Vashti Cromwell was born and raised in upstate New York. Although she was given a biblical first name by her parents and was baptized in the Lutheran Church, organized religion and church had meant little to her family. That would change many years later when her father, Arthur Cromwell, formed the Rochester, New York Society of Free Thinkers and became staunchly anti-religion. My parents didn't preach against it, but they certainly didn't emphasize the importance of it. Vashti went on to attend Cornell University. Then, after transferring to the University of Illinois, she met and married a young agriculture professor named John Pappy McCollum. They had three boys, James Terry, the oldest, Dan in the middle, and Errol, the youngest. Pap and I talked about our lack of religious convictions before we were married. One of the things probably that brought us together. And there was no question in our mind we didn't want any part of it. My father was from the rural south, and I'm sure that the hell and damnation that he was exposed to 
Sunday after Sunday had a profound effect upon him. My mother, it was just not a, uh, something that was important to her. It just didn't enter into her life. So we never went to uh, Sunday school, didn't have any church affiliation. We were uh, just, Sunday was a pretty nice day. But these were the wartime years in America. World War II was in full swing. There was pressure on everyone in the country, young and old, to pull together for the good of the nation. Not going to church was seen as unpatriotic. We're on the cusp of a religious revival. God had been with the United States in the, the war against uh, Nazi atheism. Uh, the, there's a sense that uh, we should be grateful, uh, the prosperity is tied in with patriotism and religion. Uh, and so we're on this cusp of um, moving religion into public life uh, ever more so. The biggest ceremony of its kind in post office history sees Secretary Dulles take part in the introduction of the first stamp with a religious message. As a memento of the occasion, there's a feeling that religion in the public square is a perfectly legitimate activity. And who could be against that unless you were a godless communist? Are you a member of the Communist Party? Are you now? Have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I have not refused to answer the question. I told you before I will answer this question now, fully. Mr. Your purpose is to use this to disrupt the motion picture industry. To the right not Nobody else was going to admit that uh, they didn't go to church or were not religious. The question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? It was a time of conformity. It had been a time of conformity and solidarity all through the war, and, and after the war, it was a, a time when people were very concerned about anything that seemed radical or uh, different. I think most people thought atheists were un-American, unpatriotic, uh, immoral, since in the America of that day, Morality stemmed from one source, and that was a belief in God and religious commitment. There were real costs to being an atheist um, and expressing it in, in those days. And I think most kids who had doubts about um, their religion or about God were usually silent about it. In the fall of 1944, because his old school was overcrowded, Jim McCollum moved to a new school, the Dr. Howard Elementary School. He became the only one in his fifth grade classroom not taking the voluntary religion class. Teacher said the grades that had 100% attendance, and this was a public school teacher, would get a star on the door. Well, there was one classroom that didn't have a star. That was Jim's classroom because he didn't take the class. You see, the religious teacher moved right into their classroom. Anyone that wasn't taking the class had to get out. They had them sitting in the principal's office sometimes. Well, they had to have some place to put me. And they had a desk out in the hall that they usually put kids that were troublesome. And so that's where they parked me. When mom heard about it, uh, uh, things got a little testy. It was when they put them in the hall. And that's usually assumed they're there for punishment. That he came home in tears. And that wasn't like Jim. He said never again would he go to school on the day's religious education. You just would stay home. I made up my mind, never again would he be put in the hall. That was it. No more religious education. We'd had it. Well, at Dr. Howard's school in particular, it was pretty hostile. And I had several fights and hassles. I remember one time they chased me all the way home. 
He was beaten up more than once on the way home from school. He liked to go to Y after school and do some swimming. They took his shoes away from him. He walked home in the snow without his shoes. One classmate remembers things being even worse. I watched my classmate James McCollum being victimized repeatedly, remembers William Sholem in a letter sent years later to his brother. I saw him verbally abused and badly beaten in a school environment where bullying was otherwise absent. I cannot remember the exact epithets used against James, but memory of the place, the hate in my classmates' eyes and actions, and the tears are etched in my memory as if I was there today. Mrs. McCollum knew she had to do something to protect her oldest son. In the spring of 1945, she reached a decision that would forever change the lives of her and her family. She would sue the Champaign, Illinois Board of Education to try to put a stop to the religion classes. But she insisted that she, not Pappy, would file the lawsuit. I think Pappy felt the responsibility of a married man with three kids. He liked his job here, and he knew that there'd be repercussions. Pap never once said, don't do it. Never once. If Pap had said I shouldn't do it, I don't suppose I would have listened. With three boys to feed and the family living on Pappy's modest university professor's salary, Mrs. McCollum couldn't afford a lawyer. But she heard about a group of Chicago businessmen called the Chicago Action Council, who were concerned about religion being taught in the public schools. When they heard about it, they said, tell that little lady, go ahead, we'll pay the legal bills. On Monday, June 11, 1945, with her newly hired Chicago lawyer Landon Chapman at her side, Vashti McCollum filed her lawsuit to stop the teaching of religion in the Champaign Public Schools. I filed the case, and I said, Pappy, do you suppose they'll mention it in the newspaper? He said, oh, I'm sure they will. Came out a big splash in the newspaper. Pappy saw it, and he said, now... You belong to the world. The backlash was immediate. A Chicago newspaper reported that people were shocked that Champaign has a family of atheists in its midst. In the state legislature, a member of the Illinois House of Representatives proposed a resolution asking the University of Illinois to fire anyone who was an atheist. But the resolution was withdrawn, only when it was learned that Mrs. McCollum was no longer a part-time square dancing teacher at the university. Around the McCollum house, things were suddenly different. I remember my mother talking to my brothers and me saying that everybody in town knows who we are. And if we misbehave or did bad things, it would come back and uh, uh, recoil back upon the family. Not, not in an uh, admonishing way, but trying to explain to us how, how delicate our situation was. And it was very disconcerting to realize that, hey, well, that's right, we are totally out there exposed. The McCollum trial, as it came to be known, opened in the Champaign County Courthouse on September 10, 1945. Vashti McCollum would try to convince the court that the Champaign religion classes violated what had come to be known as the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. She was also asking a court to rule for the first time that the Establishment Clause applied to the states, not just Congress. Her claims were historic, and newspapers from around the nation trumpeted the start of the trial. 
But one local Champaign newspaper took a different point of view, labeling the McCollum family as atheists and anti-Christian. It was an omen of things to come. It's very obvious that the perception of the community at the earliest court cases was that this was a case that was basically God against atheism. And the separation of church and state was not a major issue. They, they felt that the community and the, the schools were having to choose between God and atheism. The school board's attorney saw it that way too. His name was John Franklin, and he viewed this trial as an epic battle against, as he wrote, not only atheism, but even darker influences. His feelings reflected those of the local community, and he became their champion. He was an absolutely brilliant lawyer, so good that other lawyers would stop what they were doing and come watch him in court when he tried a case. The suit would be heard by the three judges of the Illinois Sixth Judicial Circuit. One judge, Frank B. Leonard of Champaign, had previously been a lawyer for the school board and was formerly one of John Franklin's law partners. The first day of the trial, a young man with a Bible under his arm strode up and uh, announced that he'd come to testify for the Lord. And I, I, I can just picture this, Franklin, this tall, lean, almost Lincoln-esque character saying, the Lord, sir, is not on trial here today. <laughs> But in this small town courtroom, the Lord really was going to be on trial. All right. Vashti McCollum's attorney, Landon Chapman, had a controversial strategy. He would use this platform to literally put religion on trial. He called witnesses from every religious denomination he could find, using them to demonstrate that it wasn't possible to have one class for all religious points of view. To Chapman, that would prove the state was promoting one specific religion. They brought in people who were Quakers, Christian scientists, um, Seventh-day Adventists. All these people came in, and, and he was able to establish the fact that, no, it, one size doesn't fit all. This, this was a sectarian class. But he saved his most aggressive tactics for the leaders of Champaign's religious community, grilling and badgering them to explain every nuance and detail of their faith the questions sometimes lasting for more than an hour. Chapman's questioning was so aggressive that, according to a report, one witness's lips began to tremble. It was done in a way that made it very difficult, especially for the family. Vashta wanted the fight raised on strictly constitutional grounds. Trying to make a monkey trial out of it was very much contrary to how she wanted the case prosecuted. He wanted to do, make a spectacle of it. But you didn't have to do it by antagonizing the Christians, ridiculing some of their Christian beliefs. And that he did. And that made me the unpopular person in the community. Her lawyer, Landon Chapman, also had another risky strategy, but one that Mrs. McCollum had agreed to putting her 10-year-old son, Jim, on the witness stand. Well, it was pretty exciting, actually. I remember the, the judge and the opposing counsel asking me if I knew what uh, uh, perjury was. Well, they didn't say that. They said, what happens if you tell a lie? And I said, I guess they throw you in the jug. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, I remember being at, and I do remember this specifically, where the John Franklin, I believe, was. Said, Did your mother or lawyer I tell you what to say at this hearing? And I said, yes. So he thought he really had something there. He said, what did they tell you to say? And I said, they told me to tell the truth. And that kind of shut that line of questioning down. But the school board's attorney, John Franklin, had a strategy of his own. He would show that Jim was a strange child and that Jim's problems at school weren't caused by the religion class, but because Jim himself was a problem. Franklin brought in popular kids from other Champaign schools to testify that, unlike Jim, sitting out the religion class didn't affect their popularity. 
Jim's own teacher testified that Jim was a misfit. Vashti McCollum, who originally filed the suit to protect her oldest son, now had to watch him being singled out and ridiculed in front of the entire country. We resented it highly. That hurt. Vash didn't want to be involved in this at all. And then have your kid torn apart at a, at a trial, opposition attorney trying to make him out as a troubled, difficult kid, just plain um, left her pretty, pretty flattened at the end of the third day of the trial. Then came Lendon Chapman's most controversial move. Despite Vashti McCollum's objections, he brought into the case her father, Arthur Cromwell, now a militant and outspoken atheist. Without Mrs. McCollum's prior knowledge, he had also included Cromwell's anti-religion pamphlet titled Rationalism Versus Religious Education in the Public Schools. They had included my grandfather's tract that he had written in protest of this, of this uh, putting religion in the public schools, which was really um, pretty far out in the sense of uh, designed to, to irritate. And that got blasted all over the place. It, um, I think my grandfather alleged that religion was a disease of the imagination contracted in early childhood. But the fact is that it did not play well in, in uh, immediate post-war America. Cromwell took the stand, but only after refusing to swear to God on the Bible. The audience gasped as they listened to the atheist in stunned disbelief. Meanwhile, John Franklin continued to blast away. This is a Corn Belt County, he declared, where we know little about atheists. He had succeeded in making the McCollum family look like a bizarre collection of atheist freaks. The trial had turned into a circus. Finally came the testimony of the Unitarian minister and Mrs. McCollum's closest ally, Philip Shug, who compared Jesus Christ to Santa Claus. The national press ate it up. The publicity got so bad that a delegation from the Chicago Action Council came down. The fact was that the Chicago Action Council had hired the attorney. Franklin finished just as he had begun characterizing this as nothing less than a holy war. Just as we are concluding a costly and bloody war which ended in victory over unchristian and infidel nations, he bellowed in his closing, the struggle of these unchristian and infidel forces against religion is being transferred to this little courtroom in central Illinois. The trial had lasted a full week. In all, 49 witnesses had been called. It would be several months before the judges announced their decision. The trial was over, but the trials for the McCollum family were just beginning. The McCollums were now the best-known atheists in the country. Life in Champaign, Illinois, became almost impossible for the family and Mrs. McCollum. She had a terrible time. The town hated her. Her husband was in the university taught floriculture, never had a raise. There was an inquiry that came down from one of the legislators to the university uh, asking if there was any reason why Dr. McCollum should not be fired. There was a lot of emotional response from the community against her stand. I can remember incidents that she had to endure in her neighborhood people marching up and down, and today, voicing your opinion in a negative way is pretty common. Um, you know, carrying signs or having marches. Back then, it was pretty unusual for people to do that, to express their opinions that strongly. They had dead cats and crap thrown on their, on their porch and on their doorknobs, 
and they were abused by everybody in the town. Nobody would even talk to them. They were outcasts. We had a cat that was, was lynched. Uh, one time, uh, Halloween, uh, my mother opened up the door to, for trick-or-treaters and was inundated in a barrage of rotten vegetables and so forth. Uh, we've got a lot of very nasty mail, a lot of obscenities involved. It didn't seem very Christian to me. <laughs> we, we received one letter that had no address on it at all. It simply said, that atheist woman and I made it all the way here to Champaign. There was a period of time when 1118 West John was the best known address in the city. Those were the particularly trying times. Oh yeah, it was, it was pretty hairy. For Jim McCollum, now in junior high school, the publicity from the trial had made his life in Champaign almost unbearable. I really couldn't study very well, so that's when my parents sent me out to New York to go to a private school and live with my grandparents. He was sent away because there was just an obvious need. I mean, he came home and would be um, assaulted by other kids and pushed around, and he was close to the breaking point. They needed to get him out of town. It was obvious. So we just accepted it as something we, that had to happen. But that wasn't right. We shouldn't have had that burden sending him away from school. That school was our school. It didn't belong to the Christians, didn't belong to any sect. It was our school. But I know when I put him on the train to go to New York by himself, he said, thanks, Mom, thanks a million. And you know, a kid that age going away by himself on the train isn't normally that grateful to be leaving home. Our business at that time was taking pictures at dances. And one night, Loretta came back with a story that some woman had approached her about going on a trip with her. Would we go and take pictures for her? Something like Vashi or some name like that? I said, you must mean Vashti McCollum. Yes, that's it. And I said, I don't know what she wants, but we'll do it. Mrs. McCollum made a trip to several other public schools in the state to find out if they were teaching religion in their classrooms. I asked her, how do you know where to go? And she says, very simple. I have a book on the public schools of the state of Illinois. And all I have to do is go down that list and see where the principal is Monsignor or some other designation of a priest. And she showed us where they were all practicing running a Catholic school in the guise of an Illinois state school. We walked through one of the schoolyards and we talked to one of the kids and we asked him, are all the kids in this school Catholic? And he said, no, but they soon will be. Four months after the trial ended, on January 26, 1946, the three judges assembled in a courtroom packed with spectators in the press. It took them a full two hours to read their decision. Jim's difficulties at school, they said, were due to his own personality problems and were not caused by the religion class. Because the classes were voluntary, the materials and teachers privately funded, and an honest attempt had been made to seek teachers of other faiths, the judges ruled the religion classes did not violate the Constitution and could continue in Champaign. The doctrine of separation of church and state, the judges read, does not mean there is a conflict between religion and state. She lost in the original court because it had never occurred to anybody that the First Amendment had any meaning in actually restricting governmental officials and what they could do. She was asking 
She was going where no, no man has traveled before. <laughs> John Franklin was delighted. He bragged to the newspapers that this program has now received the stamp of approval of the law and has established a standard by which other fair-minded people may be guided in setting up similar programs. Listening to the decision with Philip Shug by her side and wearing a brave face for the media, Vashti McCollum was furious. I hadn't exhausted my resources. Not by a long shot. I was in it for the, for the kill. I knew I was right. There was no question in my mind. Before moving forward, Mrs. McCollum decided she had to make a major change. She fired her attorney, Landon Chapman. She'd never been hired, but it's all I was offered at the time. I didn't know where I was going from there, but I knew no more Landon Chapman. Mrs. McCollum asked her friends in the law school to recommend a new attorney. One name kept coming up a 66-year-old former university professor now living in Chicago named Walter Dodd. Walter Dodd was an elderly man in semi-retirement. He was a very good constitutional lawyer, but not what you'd call a dynamic trial lawyer type, just uh, an academic, an intellectual type uh, individual who wrote textbooks, but highly regarded in, in, in uh, constitutional law circles. He agreed to take Mrs. McCollum's case to the Illinois Supreme Court. On November 19, 1946, a year and a half after she filed her original lawsuit, Mrs. McCollum drove to the state capitol in Springfield for the hearing. She went over for the oral arguments the, for the Illinois Supreme Court, watched as the uh, one or more of the justices dozed during the arguments. The justices on the bench would nod, they'd whisper to one another, and look bored. They weren't the least bit interested. It was a foregone conclusion. I knew when I left that courthouse, no difference. We had to go on. Two months later, on January 22, 1947, the Illinois Supreme Court handed down its ruling. The decision by the lower court was affirmed. Because the classes were voluntary, they could continue. Freedom of religion, the court wrote, means the right to entertain any religious belief without interference of the state. It was a unanimous decision. Well, she lost in the, in the Illinois Supreme Court because the state court uh, viewed the whole program in the Champaign Public Schools as entirely voluntary and benign. Uh, the state Supreme Court thought of the program as incidental, uh, insignificant, uh, and I think, frankly, viewed Mrs. McCollum as uh, hypersensitive and prickly uh, and a little odd to be raising such a stink about uh, such a benign program. Well, the defeats were kind of tough to take. I never thought of giving up. You see, if I let the local court's ruling stand, then that legalized it all over the country till somebody else with more stamina fought it. I was obligated to go on. There was only one place left for Mrs. McCollum to turn. On June 2nd, 1947, almost two years from the day that Mrs. McCollum filed her original lawsuit, the United States Supreme Court agreed to hear her case. Attorney John Franklin knew what was at stake in this final battle. It happens that the Establishment of Religion Clause of the First Amendment has never been the subject of a judicial construction in a case directly involving it in 160 years of our constitutional history, he wrote. Whatever the decision is in this case, it will place a construction upon that amendment and will vitally affect the lives of all of us. What he was predicting, and correctly, was that this case 
was going to determine the meaning of the First Amendment religion clauses. He's warning the court that what it does in this case may have profound implications for the future relationship of religion and uh, civil society. Uh, because the Establishment Clause was really, uh, in a real sense, up for grabs in this case. Oral arguments were set to begin in the Supreme Court building on December 8, 1947. John Franklin would again argue the case for the school board. Walter Dodd would represent Vashti McCollum. Vashti McCollum has to convince, ultimately, the U.S. Supreme Court to, to, to decide something it had never decided before, and that is organized religious activities in the public schools is unconstitutional. And, you know, to take on such a daunting task, to, to convince five justices uh, that you're right and that all of American history is wrong, uh, extremely daunting. There was a, an attorney over in Peoria. He called, asked me if I was going to the Supreme Court here in Washington. I said, oh, well, I can't afford it. He said, yes, you can. He said, you're going to go first class on the Capitol Limited. He paid my expenses. When I got to the Supreme Court, all the seats were filled. They've come so far, no place to sit. My friend's husband managed to make space for me down among the men, the lawyers, who had been admitted to the Supreme Court. And that's where I sat. But without the connivance of friends, I, I couldn't have even heard my case. The hearing began with Mrs. McCollum's lawyer, Walter Dodd, stating her case. The elderly man spoke slowly, and in a voice, according to one newspaper, so quiet you could barely hear it in the back row. Dodd was immediately hit with questions from the justices, according to a press report, in far greater numbers than are usually raised by the tribunal. It was really thrilling because I'd been to two other court hearings when everything was the other way. I hadn't really had a hearing in court. Now, for the first time with Walter Dad, I was having my day in court. The school board's attorney, John Franklin, was the complete opposite of Dodd. He waved a coin in front of the justices, saying they'd have to strike the words, in God we trust, if they ruled against him. Franklin was frequently interrupted by the justices and angered one when he claimed a ruling against him meant the justices were anti-religion. Veteran court observers were amazed at the way Franklin talked back to the justices. I think at that time, John Franklin knew that uh, this was not going to be the slam dunk that he had he had encountered in the, in the uh, circuit court or in the Illinois Supreme Court. The oral arguments ended with, as one newspaper reported, Franklin, the small town attorney, shaking his finger at the nation's highest court and declaring it could not strike down the American people's interest in religion. The court battle was finally over. Franklin returned home to his law practice, telling the local paper he was nervous at first, but got over it. He was also predicting a close decision. Before the McCollum case, the Supreme Court heard an earlier religion case that could determine the McCollum case's fate. Known as the Everson bus case, a New Jersey man sued his local school district to stop it from using tax money to pay for buses to transport students to religious schools. The court was asked to decide if this was an establishment of religion. 
A decision in favor of Everson would all but guarantee the McCollums would win. When the Everson bust decision was handed down, it was a historic moment in the Supreme Court's interpretation of the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. For the first time ever, the justices ruled that the Establishment Clause applied to the states, not just Congress. In writing the opinion of the court, Justice Hugo Black included a phrase that would have a profound effect on all future church-state cases, writing that the Establishment of Religion Clause was meant to erect, in the words Thomas Jefferson had used in a letter, a wall of separation between church and state. It was a momentous ruling. The Everson decision had to be very encouraging for Mrs. McCollum uh, because first it established that the First Amendment's Establishment Clause applied to the states and that was not previously established and, and that was a hurdle that she had to get over in order to win her case. Second, the court adopted this rhetoric about separation and the wall uh, between church and state uh, which was very favorable to her claim. But the Everson decision was also confusing. Despite the court's language about the wall of separation, the justices ruled five to four against Everson. Taxpayer support for busing children to religious schools was legal. The decision was potentially a bad omen for Mrs. McCollum. Although Everson had endorsed this view of this wall of separation, Jefferson's metaphor of the wall, it had in fact not overturned uh, the state law. So Mrs. McCollum had to ask the court to go the next step, not only to endorse in abstract concept the wall of separation, but to really give it meaning and force. <laughs> Winter came, and the McCollum family waited. This was something that never was not on your mind. This was a huge part of our life for three years. As you know, the Supreme Court usually hands down rulings on a Monday. Every Monday, I was pretty close to the telephone. On that particular Monday, I got the, the call. It was cloudy and cold on March 8, 1948, when the call finally came. For Vashti McCollum, three years of what she described as headlines, headaches, and hatred were about to reach their conclusion, one way or another. We had a, one of these uh, phones, I've never seen one quite like it, that actually hung to the wall. My, how she hated that phone. But the uh, phone rang and she uh, picked it up and the reporter said she'd won and asked for a comment. And then there were some very nice pictures of her posing next to the phone. <laughs> it was a resounding eight to one decision. The religion classes had been ruled unconstitutional. It was the first ever violation of the Establishment Clause and the first time in American history that the Supreme Court prohibited a religious activity in a public school. It was the beginning of the separation of church and state in public schools. The Supreme Court rules eight to one. Now, you're lucky it's five to four, but eight to one of striking. I called my parents' home. Mother answered the phone. My son Jim was there. She told him, he threw up his hands. He said, I knew mom was right. Pappy was sick in bed that day. I opened the door. He said he knew as soon as I opened that door that I won. The court made it clear that the key to its decision, what was different from the Everson case, 
was that the religion classes were held on public school property during regular school hours. Writing the majority opinion in the McCollum case was Justice Hugo Black. Again, as he had in his opinion in the Everson bus case, Black called for a wall of separation between church and state. The most important thing about Justice Black's opinion uh, was its strident description uh, of this wall of separation as being rigid, high, impregnable. Uh, and that concept, uh, sort of an organizing principle of First Amendment thought, sticks and uh, continues to exert influence today. While Justice Black wrote the majority opinion, Justices Robert Jackson and Felix Frankfurter, both still voting with the majority, wrote separate opinions that disagreed with some of Black's opinion. Jackson wrote that although he agreed, he felt the ruling had gone too far. The opinion in McCollum for the court is classic Justice Black. He paints in broad and absolute strokes. Uh, he seizes on an idea, this wall of separation, and for him, that settles the case. Justice Jackson and others see the conflict as much more complex, as much more nuanced. I think the U.S. Supreme Court justices, they're not naive. They knew that this is a controversial decision, but they felt uh, confident in it. Some years ago, Justice Scalia told me, you know, he voted for the majority, saying that you have a constitutional right to burn the flag, because that's free speech. And he said that he thought a justice was acting properly when he did something that was against his personal beliefs, because then he knew he was ruling that way because it had to be the law. He was being really objective. And he said, I slept well that night. And I think the justices in McCollum slept well that night. The Champaign School District quickly announced the end of religious classes. I don't know that the community was happy about the results. I don't know that the schools or the Champaign felt it was the right decision. We, we, were, we were disappointed. Other districts around the country began dropping their religion classes too. John Franklin remained defiant, even to the end. The local paper, the Champaign News Gazette, did too. I think the communists will rejoice over this court's decision, said one local minister. Life returned to normal around the McCollum household. Although the case had made Mrs. McCollum a frequent speaker at meetings around the country. People speak about my courage and so forth. Not particularly. I did what I had to do. As Dan says, sometimes our culture picks on the wrong person at the wrong time. I was fortunate in that I could do something about it. And that I didn't think twice, I did. The Supreme Court was a great teacher of the nation because the great majority of people in this country would just accept McCollum now. 50 years ago, it was shocking. Now it's oh-hum. And so maybe that's what's important about McCollum. Oh-hum, we now accept it. And that's true, I suppose, of all great ideas. They go from the stage of this is impossible to, of course. And McCollum is here, of course.